Alright, so in this last section we want to talk about graphing and how we can determine the equivalency point from the graph. So we've already looked at the normal graph and so this is standardly done by putting the titrant on the x-axis and then the change in what you're looking at on the y-axis. In the case of a titration with a weak acid with a strong base, this is going to give us a sigmoidal plot. We see the pH changing over time as we add the volume of the base, right? So it's starting out at the acidic side. We reach that pH, which is the equivalency point where the moles of the base are going to be equivalent to the moles of the acid. The addition of more sodium hydroxide at that time is going to result in that increase in the pH up to that basic level. So this is a normal graph and oftentimes we'll be able to identify the equivalency point from this type of graph. However, sometimes the uh, equivalency point does not show up really well and so it might be hard to see on this type of graph. So we have some derivative graphs that we can do to try to help us identify that point. So the first derivative graph you can see the equivalency point here and drop it down right here at the 50 mark. So you still have the volume of the base on the x-axis, but now the plot on the y-axis is the change in pH over the change in the volume of the base. And you can see plotting your data in this point oftentimes will give you a very nice indicator of where that equivalence point is going to hit. All right, so to do this first derivative graph, right, you've got your volume of your base, you've got the pH, so this is what you're using to calculate that normal graph. And so our new y-axis for the first derivative needs to be the change in the pH over the change in the volume. So here, we're gonna set up three new columns. The first is the change in the pH. The second is the change in the volume. And then you can do the first derivative, which is the division of those two. And then you can graph this in Excel. So you would graph this on the x-axis and graph the first derivative on the y-axis. So to, to find that change in pH, you're going to take the value above it and subtract the value below it. And that gives you this 0.2 value here. And you keep doing that as you go up. So un unfortunately, these are all 0.2, so you don't see that change as easily. For the change in the volume, you're going to take the volume above, subtract off the volume below, and then plot that here. So you've got 0.86 minus 0.25, and you get the change in the volume. Divide the two in this column, and you can get the first derivative graph. So if the first derivative graph does not allow you to identify the equivalency point, you can do a second derivative graph. So this is going to be the change in the first derivative over the change in the volume that we're going to end up plotting on the y-axis. And we still are plotting the volume of the base over here. So let's take a look at that, what that looks like in your spreadsheet view. All right, so our y-axis is the change in the first derivative over the change in the volume. So last time we had our plots, we added those three new ones here to get our first derivative. Now we're gonna add one more column over here. You're gonna skip and don't put anything in this first box. So your second derivative starts at the second position. And so we're going to take the change in the first derivative, right, which is going to be this value here and subtracting off this value here. And then we're going to divide that whole thing by the volume change, right? So that is our delta V. So when you're setting up this cell here, it's going to look like this. You're gonna put equals parentheses, this value here minus this value here, and parentheses divided by your delta V. And that gives you that second derivative plot. So the second derivative plot, let's go back and look at it here. You can see the equivalency point will show up here in the center 
again, coming off of the central line for your point at the equivalency point. So if your first derivative graph will not show this, oftentimes the second derivative graph will show this. So there's one additional way that you can graph your data to try to see the equivalency point, and that's called a grand plot. So in the grand plot, you're still plotting the volume of the base on the x-axis, but now over here on the y-axis, you're plotting the volume of the base times the concentration of the acid that's in the solution. So let's take a look at what this would look like in the Excel view. All right, so now we've got two more columns that we need to set up in our Excel spreadsheet. The first one is going to be the grand plot. The second is going to be the concentration of the acid. And so up here, we're looking at what we would place as the formula in this red box here. Right, so it is going to be the concentration of the acid in solution. So you can calculate that at each uh, physical change. So we know how to calculate that based on our formula. So we've gone over in class. So you can set that up in Excel to be able to calculate that for you at each position. So we now have the concentration of our acid. We're going to multiply it by the volume of the base. Right, and that will give us this value in here. And then we can drag that down and we can form our grand plot. So this would be the y axis. This would still be the x axis. So going back to that grand plot, you can see that you get a very sharp flattening of the line here onto the x axis. And at that inflection point here, that's the equivalence point. All right, so that's uh, some different ways that you can plot your data. You will have a homework problem that lets you practice these different graphing techniques. Use this tutorial to help you set up your graphs. All right, and then the very last topic that we wanna talk about, just in a little bit more detail, are the indicators, right? So for acids and bases, typically the indicators are going to be organic dyes. So this is because the organic dyes typically have one highly colored conjugate acid base species. So when you do a titration with this, it results in a change in both the pH and the color of the molecule. And so at that change window, you can see this color change. And so if you know the characteristics of these dyes, you can use them to help indicate the end point of your titration provided that the color change of the indicator occurs where your equivalence point should be. So there's a large number of these dyes that you can utilize for indicators through your titration. So you've got a nice list here, um, and you can see the pH change range that occurs, and you can see the colors in acidic or the basic side of this change window. So methyl red, for example, shifts at, starts shifting at about 4.2, finishes shifting at about 6.3, and the pKa for this dye is 5. Phenolphthalein, on the other hand, is colorless in the acidic solution, and it turns red in the basic solution, and its change window starts at about 8.3 and goes to 10, with the Ka being 9.6. So if you wanted something that changed at about pH 7, right, you're going to maybe select something like bromothymol blue would be a good one for there that changes between 6 and 7.6, and its pKa value is 7.1. So what is this change window exactly? You've got this indicator range, the pKa of the uh, colored dye is right in the middle of the change window. There'll be a period where the pH change will cause the color change of the dye molecule. So that's indicating that the whole species of uh, dye that's in the sample is converting to the other form, right, and changing so that it gives off the other color. Right, so this is kind of that change window or transition range where it starts and then where it stops, and it's going to be centered at the pKa. All right, and that finishes off our section on titrimetry.